The Tynan Weir Metro has two lines known simply as the Green and Yellow Lines. We shall start with the former. The Green Line runs to South Hilton via Regent Centre, South Gosforth, Heweth and Sunderland. Our journey begins at the airport. The modern airport lies roughly six and a half miles to the northwest of Newcastle city centre and is the 11th busiest in the United Kingdom. Down a steep slope is the terminus of the metro, where trains terminate on a dedicated island platform, trains arriving and departing every 12 minutes. The two coaches, comprising of two vehicles, are known as metro cars or class 994s and have been in service on the metro since the opening day. The crossovers here allow trains to access either platform. The metro cars are well known on the line, having been built between 1978 and 1981 by Metro Camel in Birmingham. The maximum speed limit these trains can reach on the line is 50 miles per hour, or 80 kilometers per hour, which, incidentally, all speed limit signs are shown in kilometers. 88 units in total are seen on the entire network, carrying hundreds of thousands of passengers every year. The airport was reached from Bankfoot on the 17th of November 1991 at a cost of £12 million to construct. Before then, the service between Bankfoot and the airport was operated by the M77 shuttle bus. Most of all the metro's level crossings are not barriered, so therefore some motorists may ignore the warning sirens and rush across, putting themselves in danger. However, they will receive a penalty for doing so, as traffic cameras have been installed on either side of the line. Callerton Parkway opened in conjunction with the airport extension in 1991. It is in fact the second station to have opened on this section of line and to find out why we have to go back in time to the origins of the railway. Callerton station was on the other side of the level crossing. It had opened way back on the 1st of June 1905 by the North Eastern Railway, who had built a route towards Pontyland and Dallas Hall Throughout its whole length, it was a single track. Interestingly, the line to Darras Hall required a reversal at Pontyland and had opened eight years later in 1913. Not surprisingly, the hoped for passenger traffic never reached expectations, always running at a loss, meaning that retraction of passenger trains ceased in 1929, but the line remained open for freight to access the ICI chemicals plant at Callerton and Road Trees Chocolate Factory at Falden. This continued way into Metro days before the freight trains finally threw in the towel in 1989.
It was the 10th of May 1981 that the second stage of the entire metro system opened to here from South Gosforth. As was the way of certain metro termini, the approach road was singled until 1991 when three tracks were added with the aforementioned freight traffic running in the middle and being unelectrified. British Rail had coincidentally owned the tracks north of Bankfoot with standard plates reading Accept BR Trains, marking the end of the Metro Territory until 1984. A station has been on this site since 1905, variously known as Kenton and Kenton Bank until passengers were withdrawn in 1929, but its prosperity continued in the shape of a goods station until January 1966. A common feature at certain stations over the network is the staggered platforms separated by the level crossing and Kingston Park is one such example. It serves the suburb of Kingston Park as well as the retail park and the Tesco Extra Superstore, once the largest in Britain. On the 22nd of March 1983, there was a collision here when a train ran into the side of a Tynan Weir bus, causing significant damage to the bus and injuring the driver, but also derailing the four coaches of the train. No one was killed in the accident, though it predated the construction of the station. A1 Great North Road is cross just here, the subject of the road driver's eye view from Swalewell to Edinburgh. Another station with staggered platforms, this is Falden. The platform we are arriving at occupies the site of the former Cox Lodge station, again opening in 1905 and closing in 1929.
Wandsbeck Road is on an embankment high above the road that bears that station's name. Notice ahead the tracks widening out on the concrete span, a reminder of the single line infrastructure that had operated here. Just beyond the station, the line crossed over the Falden Wagonway, which was a one mile long line built in 1818, living and breathing until 1826. Its method of propulsion was horse and carriage before being partly taken over by rope haulage to the nearby wide open and Falden collieries, where coal was exported to barges on the Tyne at Wool's End. Included within the wagonway were stationary steam engines to assist with the cable haulage up the steep plains transported at a mere walking pace. Soon it was superseded by the Brunton and Shields Wagonway, latterly the Seaton Burn Wagonway, where it finished at Whitehill Point. This caused the Thousand Wagonway to close. Regent Centre is technically a subsurface station, although it gives out the appearance of an underground station. Up above is the interchange with a variety of different bus routes at the busy bus station, situated on the Great North Road. The station takes its name from the Regent Centre Business Park, just a short walk away. The underground station has been little altered from 1981, with the interiors remaining the same, apart from the removal of the ticket barriers in the 2010s. Totally obliterated by the new station was the site of West Gosforth. Beyond Regent Centre, we pass over the junction which leads to the South Gosforth Track Maintenance Depot, positioned in the centre of the triangular fork with the yellow line towards Tynemouth and Whitley Bay. Trains once upon a time did continue beyond here when it was part of the Tyneside Loop. Originally the depot opened in 1923 by the LNER, to stable their old Tyneside electric stock fleet, and today all the metro cars are stabled, repaired and maintained here. Curving away from the depot compound, the line swings towards the south where we shall join the yellow line and run with it as far as Pelor. The Metro's yellow line forms the very first part of the Metro to open on the 11th of August 1980 from Haymarket to Tynemouth via South Gosforth and Whitley Bay. Presently, the Metro's routes that are overground run on former railway routes such as the line we have just traversed from the airport. This route uses much of the infrastructure of the North Tyneside Loop, which refers to a plethora of different railway companies who built lines to interconnect with one another, mainly to export the coal to the harbours on the River Tyne. Before the North Tyneside Loop, the route through here was built by the Blythe and Tyne Railway Company, 
incorporated in 1853 and opened in 1861. Over the years, it expanded in strength and size, extending their routes out towards Ashington and Morpeth to get their hands on the prosperous mineral traffic. So successful it was that a local passenger service had soon commenced and by 1874 was absorbed by the NER. However, the BNTR retained its individual identity during this period. As is the way of things, the coal traffic eventually declined in the 1970s. This also included passengers and mineral traffic accordingly. Business had hit an all-time low. The British Rail system was identified as being the poorest transport system in the country, one of its main reasons for being held back of the region's economy. The decision was to modernise the routes around the Tyneside area, with certain old stations and bridges being swiftly converted for a rapid transit system. The lines in the Tyneside area were one of the first in the country to be electrified in a response to the early tramways of the period. The Tyneside electrics, as they were known, commenced in 1904, starting on a scaled down third rail 600 volts DC system using special NER electric multiple units. South Shields hadn't been reached by the third rail system until 1938 completing the whole route from north to south. Yet, now under the control of BR, this marked the end of the electric services in the 1960s, as it was decided to convert the routes to diesel operation. As a consequence to this, the passenger traffic declined immensely, as trains had become slower and dirtier, a massive backward step that had not been foreseen. Coming to the rescue was the Tyneside Passenger Transport Authority in 1971 and after many studies and projects formed the rundown railways into the metro system we see today. Here we arrive at West Jesmond, opening by the NER in 1900 under the name of Moore Edge. For many years before the 1970s, the station had original glass awnings to shelter passengers from the rain and sun, but all that remains are the sawn-off remnants. The Metro comes under the umbrella of Nexus, who is responsible for the coordination of public transport in the county of Tynan Weir. Nexus has pursued a number of projects, hoping to continue improving transport in the Tynan Weir. The main focus, of course, was the Metro, whose project, Metro All Change, is supposed to take 11 years at a cost of £389 million where funding will go towards upgrading infrastructures, stations and brand new trains. It is expected to end in 2023. The single line ahead was where the Blythe and Tide continued towards Newcastle Central and the East Coast Main Line. These days it is used for empty rolling stock to reach Manor's metro station on the Yellow Line Loop. We've now arrived at the underground station of Jesmond, dating from August 1980. The original station on the BTR was located on the link line to Central Station, but was closed in 1978 as a result of the Metro project. In common with South Gosforth, it had opened in 1864, three years after the line itself. The line is now underground as far as Gateshead Stadium, where we enter the full-size concrete tube tunnels designed specifically for the Metro. Serving the city centre of Newcastle had been appalling for many years. 
the only stations were Manners and Newcastle Central. So when the Passenger Transport Board took over, their survey saw the opportunity to build an underground network that would be more satisfactory. The parliamentary bill was granted to the Tyneside Metropolitan Railway in 1973 with other funds being projected from central government grants and local sources resulting in 70% of contribution. The first terminus of the TWM Haymarket is situated right in the city centre, being close to the universities of Newcastle and Northumbria as well as the civic centre and bus station. In 2006 the station was completely refurbished, costing £20 million with brighter lighting and interiors and installing new escalators. Whilst the station was the temporary terminus of the metro, trains used to reverse by the trailing crossovers located halfway between here and Monument. Following the inevitable extension to Heweth on the 15th of November 1981, the crossover soon became unnecessary. The extension had caused considerable commotion to property owners in the vicinity, including the old Tatler Cinema and Nobles Assessment Arcade, that were demolished to make way for the new station and line. This station takes its name from the monument situated above the station dedicated to the second Earl of Grey, Charles Grey, unveiled in 1838. Standing at 130 foot high, the column was designed by local architects John and Benjamin Green and Edward Hodges Bailey, creator of Nelson's column in Trafalgar Square. Monument Station is the busiest on the network and is the interchange with the Yellow Line loop between St James and Tynemouth, beginning its services one year later after our line had arrived here. The station's notoriety is the Yellow Line's pretzel configuration where the line passes through the same station twice. A rare sort of pre-arrangement, it is one of three in the world to have this procedure. The others are in The Hague, Netherlands and Sofia, Bulgaria. Probably this is the largest interchange on the line as it connects with the National Rail Station located above streets level. Once up and out of the ground, passengers can change on the mainline suburban services as far as London, Edinburgh, Aberdeen, Birmingham, Manchester, Liverpool, Plymouth and Penzance. There are also local trains to Sunderland, Middlesbrough and Carlisle. The station is managed by the LNER. £6 million was the total cost of revamping the metro station platforms, with work beginning in September 2015, resulting in closing the station from 8pm every Sunday to Thursday until late 2016. Departing the central station, our train curves away to face even further south. As the main city was established on high ground, the obstacle now faced for the metro was the River Tyne itself. With no option of going deeper underground, the railway had to cross it and so we now emerge into daylight to cross the river by means of the Queen Elizabeth II Bridge. The bridge was built in two sections simultaneously from each bank, 
eventually meeting in the middle after nearly two years from 1976. The Queen herself officially opened the bridge on the 6th of November 1981, just nine days before the full service began running to Hewitt. The train heads back underground, wheedling its way under the suburban district of Gateshead. Gateshead, situated on the southern bank of the mighty River Tyne, is an interchange station with the busiest bus station in the Tyne and Weir County. With the start of the metro services here, the former British Rail Station on the Durham coastline closed in 1981, having a lifespan of 137 years. Due to dissimilar rock structures compared to the north side of the Tyne, the station was built different to those in central Newcastle, as a box-shaped area. Another significant difference was the shape of the tunnels which the trains run through. Instead of the typical tube-shaped layout, the tunnels were excavated as a square. The train emerges from the underground tunnels to turn towards the southeast, coming alongside the network rail Durham coastline from Newcastle Central. The island platform takes its name from the nearby Gateshead International Stadium that had opened in 1955. The station however only opened in 1981 as part of the third phase of the metro system and the platforms were refurbished only relatively recently in 2015. We parallel the network rail line from here all the way to Pelor. The Durham coastline was formed by an amalgamation of small self-governing railway companies, some challenging with one another for traffic such as passengers or goods. Eventually this all changed when the North Eastern Railway linked them all together to form the vital coastal route we see today in 1905. In this fragment of the country, most of the railways became a part of the London and North Eastern Railway and the DCL was no exception. This section, from Newcastle Central to Monks Wearmouth, was built by the Braidling Junction Railway and opened in 1839 on August the 30th. Our train now arrives at the stop at Felling that had an original station in 1839 
opened for the Bradling Junction Railway. It was moved to the current position in 1896 and closed in 1979 during the conversion period. An express train derailed here on the 26th of March 1907, bound for Newcastle, where eight people were seriously injured, two of whom later died. Hewith is an interchange station with the DCL and a modern bus station established next to the entrance. The British Rail Station had opened here in 1979, following closely two years later by the Metro, who terminated their trains here for three years until the line was extended in 1984 to South Shields. As we leave Hewith, we pass underneath the four-way junction with the A184 Abbotsford Road. This is the last station where both the yellow and green lines share the same tracks. There have been platforms here at P. Law since 1843. Only seven years later, the line became a junction with the Newcastle and Darlington Junction Railway who built the cut-off route to Durham via Washington. It had been known as the Leam Side Line, but was mothballed by British Rail during 1991 after the freight terminal at Follingsby closed, which was the main source of its mineral traffic. Furthermore, the open cast coal mine at Wardley also succumbed to closure a few years later. We pass the carriage sidings, used to store certain multiple units after service hours.
A complex junction now entails as tracks from the South Shields and South Hilton lines all diverge here. Additionally, the redundant Leamside line passes underneath here also. The two separate tracks from both NR and TWR end and both merge together just after Pelor Junction. This is the only place in Britain where network rail trains come underneath the electric wires of the 1500 volt DC current, albeit with diesel power rather than electric. We are now travelling over the final 11.5 miles of our journey to South Hilton via Sunderland which required trains to run over network rail tracks. It opened on the 31st of March 2002, totalling at a cost of £100 million. Notice the signals, these are now displaying four colour light aspects, meaning our train is now under the control of Network Rail, their signalling centre based at the Tyneside Integrated Electronic Control Centre. Running at the maximum authorised speed for the metro car, this is one of the longest distance between intermediate stations. This is Fellgate, the station presents itself on top of a high embankment, so therefore step-free access has been attained for the mobility impaired. We cross the A19 dual carriageway.
We're now approaching Broccoli Winds, the triangular junction with the freight only branch line to reach Granico Works to the Tyne docks. Formerly the station was served by mainline trains, boasting just one platform located on the downline. Therefore, trains towards Newcastle had to temporarily change tracks to allow passengers to alight or board. The second platform was added in 1870 after the inevitable fatal accident occurred here. A mineral line crossed our path here. It was the Stanhope and Tyne Railway, built to convey the limestone from the quarries at Stanhope and the coals from West Consett to the Tyne docks. The line opened piecemeal, with services officially beginning on the 15th of May 1834, with passengers being carried at a later date. A square junction was added around Brockley Winds in 1840, letting trains travel in either directions during the height of the railway boom. The southern apex of the square was removed long ago. Trains also did continue into South Shields, which is where the freight trains temporarily headed towards before they curved away from that alignment and into the docks themselves. Further connection with the Tyne docks converged just here on the left. Once called Clarendon Road for steam services, the station was renamed East Bolden in 1898. Since 2013, this has been the busiest suburban station on the network, with commuters travelling to both Newcastle and Sunderland respectively. Our train passes into rural fields, a past reminder of how it used to be before housing estates sprung up around the line during the 1920s and 30s.
Here we cross over the strangely named Cutthroat Dean. Train standing at platform one is for South Hilton. The area here is affluent, serving the attractive areas of Fulwell, Seaburn and Roker. The station was opened by the LNER in 1937. We can now see an abandoned wasteland showing us the former route to the Wearmouth docks that incidentally opened at the same time as our line, 1839. We are now in the city of Sunderland, sitting on the mouth of the mighty river Weir. In 2011 there has been a record of 174,000 people residing in the city. Sunderland was originally founded as a few small settlements since 674 to 685 AD the city has grown in size and stature when the port was built allowing the exports of coal and salt to be transferred all over the world. Residents sometimes refer to themselves as Macam so that they are distinguished from the Geordies who reside in the Newcastle area. It's just a 10 minute walk away to the stadium that is the home of Sunderland AFC.
On the 30th of August 1839, the Braidling Junction Railway ended here at Monks Wearmouth. The platforms and footbridge are still extant, but no longer see any railway usage since 1967. St Peter's is now the replacement station and opened along with the Metro extension to South Hilton in 2002. Returning to Monks Wearmouth, the impressive station facade built in 1848 to a design by Thomas More has since 1973 now opened in a new guise as a museum dedicated to football. There have been talks of reopening the old station for the metro, but due to the platforms being too narrow, the ideal solution was a brand new station at St Peter's. Already on high ground, the metro now crosses over the valley of the River Weir by means of the Monks Wearmouth Bridge adjacent to the road bridge. It had originally been built by the Monks Wearmouth Junction Railway, providing the first direct connection between Newcastle and Sunderland in 1879. The iron bowstring bridge consists of a central span that is 300 foot long and 86 feet above the water supported by stone that includes three 25-foot span masonry arches. The train now resumes to its underground existence as far as Park Lane. Notice the portholes in the tunnel roof, where smoke from the steam engines used to be expelled. The station at Sunderland is now underground following a property development being rafted above the line in 1965. The platforms have been split from 1 to 4, the metro using the northern end of the station designated 3 to 4, whereas Network Rail, Northern and Grand Central trains use platforms 1 and 2. The present station was officially opened in 1879 as Sunderland Central, or locally known as the New Station, because it avoided confusion with other city stations at Facet Lane and Hendon. It's hard to believe an overall roof used to cover the platforms here. A sign reminds drivers on the metro that there is no access to the Durham coastline, as it splits away from here 
and becomes unelectrified, entering the Sunderland Tunnel. This route towards Hartlepool and Middlesbrough was the final link in the chain of the DCL and opened in 1905. Park Lane serves the busiest bus station in the UK outside London, with routes bound for all points of the spectrum. This is the final stretch of line for us on the Green Line to South Hilton, and we travel over the former NER Main Line to Penshaw on the aforementioned Leamside Line. This was the route built by the Newcastle and Darlington Junction Railway as a branch line, making a junction to the north of the one-time Penshaw Station to Sunderland Facet Street in 1852. Sadly, both lines were never a financial success, withdrawing the passenger traffic along here on the 30th of April 1981. Just to our right, before Millfield Station, we can see remnants of the former Hendon Docks Junction, where the heavy freight trains used to diverge off towards the docks themselves. The link is now closed, but there is still rail activity to the docks from the Durham coastline. The present 2002 station stands on the site of the 1890 built York, Newcastle and Berwick Railway station. The original of 1853 was located just beyond the bridge carrying Hilton Road. Closure came for the old station in 1955.
we pass the site of the former Pallian station, which closed in 1964 to passengers. Today's station is 150 metres north of the original, following a deviation in the railway alignment owing to construction of the dual carriageway alongside. This is the penultimate stop on the Green Line and the nearest station to the Northern Spire Bridge over the River Weir. This signal will only display a yellow or a red, being the last before the buffer stop at South Hilton. A classic Tynan Weir metro terminus being approached on a single line to aid a quick reversal for the driver. Of course the first station, Hilton, was located on the other side of Hilton Bank. Whether the line reopens to passengers once again towards Durham and beyond, only time will tell. <laughs> 